Thank you to War Thunder for sponsoring this video. There's one incredible aspect of the Assassin's Creed series, and that's the detail and historical accuracy of each world. The series takes us to places like Renaissance Italy, the French Revolution, and even ancient Egypt. It's easy to see why so many of us love these games. Now as somebody that plays Assassin's Creed quite extensively, it's the design of each world for me that makes the series so special. So what I'm going to do in this video is rank the world of all 13 mainline Assassin's Creed games from worst to best. Now this video was quite hard to make, as I wouldn't really say there's a single game in the series that just straight up has a shit world, but instead it's more so less appealing compared to the games after. Now I made a similar video to this almost a year ago, but that video was not the best for quite a few reasons. For one, my opinions in that video were based on my memories of playing the games when they first came out, and for two, I've changed my mind about a lot of the decisions in that video, and since making that video, I've replayed every Assassin's Creed game, which means I now have updated thoughts about each game's world and it's still fresh in my mind. So what better video to make than this one? Now do remember that this entire video is my own opinion, so try not to get triggered if you disagree with a specific choice. Anyway, if you do enjoy this video do consider hitting that subscribe button and with that said let's get right into it So starting off at 13th place is Assassin's Creed Valhalla's world, and if this video was a video on which world is the most well represented in terms of history, it would definitely be up there, but that's not what this is about. Now when it comes to Viking England and even Norway in this game, it's not bad in terms of how appealing the visuals are. In fact, graphically it's probably a top 2. Now the world of Valhalla is set a few centuries after the Romans rule in Britain, resulting in English towns and cities being constructed within the remnants of ancient Roman structures. That's why you'll notice that almost all the buildings throughout Valhalla's world, especially in England, are structured in a very similar way. Although I'm not particularly fond of this architectural choice, I will say it does do a decent job of conveying the image of a society undergoing changes and living among the shadows of a once dominant empire. But the problem to me lies in what's actually in the world of Valhalla. It's, I believe, the largest landmass in the entire series. And before anyone says Odyssey is, I'm just referring to land size. Anyway, because of the sheer size of Valhalla's world, it's what's contained within that's disappointing. With so much territory to cover, it's easy to to get overwhelmed and lost in the world, but not lost in a way where there's an abundance of engaging things to do. I'm talking about how there is quite literally not much to do or interact with besides the likes of forgettable mysteries, flighting, raiding, anomalies and fishing among other very forgettable additions. I want you to answer me this. Can you really remember the name of a single side quest off the top of your head? I know I can't, and considering Valhalla has quite a fair amount of side quests, or as they call it in this game as mysteries, it is quite easy to forget them. The world of Valhalla opts for large stretches of empty landscapes, forests and hills. Now some of you might argue that this portrayal of desolation is a true representation of England during the Viking era, and whilst that is true in some aspects, it just honestly diminishes the game's enjoyment of offering few interactive elements or activities outside of the cities and towns, and a lot of these specific quests and activities feel very repetitive with barely any variation to them. I have nearly 100 hours into the game and I'd be lying to you if I said those 100 hours were worth the effort of exploration I put in. City exploration in Valhalla can be less engaging with cities feeling small and sparse and movement through the towns is often restricted to specific paths. This to me is a big departure from earlier games where we had more freedom to explore which sounds pretty stupid considering it's an open world game. Even using the longbow in the rivers of England does not really offer the same level of excitement or discovery as the naval gameplay in a game like Black Flag or dare I say it, even Odyssey. So yeah, while Valhalla's world is aesthetically pleasing and its graphics are top notch, you need to dive into the game itself to fully evaluate its merits or lack thereof. Okay, now in 12th place, I've gone with the world of Assassin's Creed Rogue, a game set in North America during the Seven Years' War. The concept of playing as a former assassin turned Templar is intriguing, yet the setting itself did not really captivate me as much as the ones after in this video. The main issue for me is not actually in the visual appeal of the game, but more so the fact that everything we see in Assassin's Creed Rogue is already featured in past Assassin's Creed games, and I mean everything from movement, animations, the sailing, and just the architectural style of many of the buildings. The time period on paper being the Seven Years War does not exactly scream excitement to me personally. The game does have some pretty nice looking visuals, whether it's icy landscapes, snow covered shipwrecks and a pretty decent sized river valley to explore. However, Rogue struggles to carve out a distinct identity within the series. Much of what it offers feels familiar, only with less budget. Of course, the one year development time did not exactly lend a helping hand in that regard. The river valley part of the game to me feels like bits of the frontier from Assassin's Creed 3 just cut up and pasted into the world with slight alterations. And going back to my earlier point about the world being already featured in previous Assassin's Creed games. The city of New York, which we know is of course the main city for the game, was already explored in Assassin's Creed 3. 
Of course, this time it's before the Great Fire of New York, but even then, it's not a city that appears to me personally. One thing I would have loved to see in Rogue was being able to explore Lisbon a little bit more, because even during the earthquake mission, parts of Lisbon looked appealing, even if it was getting absolutely destroyed in the process. Oh yeah, and another major issue is, if you watch my exploring cut content video, then you'd know a lot of Rogue's world could have been entirely different. For example, there's an undisclosed location that was intended to be a very important area of where assassins gathered, and Shay himself would have visited this location a few times. There's also the idea of Philadelphia as an explorable city being cut from the game, which could have easily made the setting of Rogue more appealing and maybe be placed higher in this video. And even the fact that the North Atlantic map in the game is missing key features that not many people would notice, which goes back to my point about the game only having a year of development. So yeah, unfortunately Rogue's world to me is just wasted potential and a lot of it is recycled from past games with just slight alterations. Okay, so I'm sure you're probably surprised to see Assassin's Creed Brotherhood's Rome at 11th place in this video, especially considering the amount of comments I receive on a regular basis calling me an SEO fanboy, so you might be surprised by this one. Now do note that every single world after Valhalla in this video is not bad at all. I know 11th place looks bad, but that's the problem when you have 11 other good looking settings. Certain worlds will have to fall short. Now Rome in Assassin's Creed Brotherhood is well designed. It's full of history and matching architecture of the time period. However, a few reasons made me place it lower on my list. First, when comparing it to other settings in the series, Rome to me is lacking a lot in variety. The thing about Assassin's Creed settings is that we get transported to incredible cultures. London's busy streets, colonial America's forests, ancient Egypt, each with its own unique culture and look to it. And whilst Rome, while it's impressive, it just doesn't offer the same level of variety. It just mostly feels like one massive city with similar streets and buildings throughout. If you compare it to the game that came before, being Assassin's Creed 2, the world of that game features multiple distinct areas and cities. Venice, Florence, Tuscany, Forli, San Gimignano, and even the Apennine Mountains if you want to include that. There's just so much variety. But then Assassin's Creed Brotherhood releases after, which should be a step up for the world as you think, but the one monotonous city did not hit the same for me. Yes, it's got iconic landmarks like the Colosseum and Castel San Angelo, but it's that absence of multiple cities to explore as well as a very monotonous Rome is what lowers it for me. There's also the fact that 60% of the entirety of Rome in the game is just brown fields and empty space, all accommodated by the Colosseum just sitting there in the middle. It also did not help that many assets were reused, and the overall world closely resembles what we encountered in Assassin's Creed 2 with slightly upscale textures. Yes, visually it's a massive step up from the two games before, but graphics is not everything. So with that said, 12th place for me belongs to Assassin's Creed Brotherhood. Yep, you read that right. Assassin's Creed Revelations is in 10th place, so that's back to back Ezio games in this video with settings that I find to be kind of underwhelming. If this was a main story ranking then Revelations would be near the top, but that's not what this is. Now the idea of exploring Constantinople in Assassin's Creed Revelations or modern day Istanbul as it is now is pretty good. The city is rich in very different but vibrant colours, and the architecture is a massive positive as it stands out from a lot of what we've previously seen with the Renaissance Italy in the past two games. Even just climbing the city's distinctive dome shaped mosques and parkouring over its unique skyline is truly rewarding. The idea of a setting taking place during the Ottoman Empire also is fascinating. And with all the positives I just said, you may wonder why I placed it in 10th place. Well, as the initial excitement of this new game and new setting fades, we're pretty much left with a large map that lacks any type of diversity. And before the game was released, we were promised very distinct districts to explore. But the reality is Revelations Constantinople is not diverse at all. It's a map that merges the scenery into one, with very identical looking areas in every corner you look, whether it's north of the map or all the way to the south. I will say the landmarks in the game are the standout for me in terms of visual appeal, as the likes of the Hagia Sophia is a building that has so much detail to it, in its interior or even the exterior. However, while Constantinople's vibrant streets were quite fun to explore, certain areas like the Galata district did not quite meet the mark set by other locations in the series. Positioned across the Golden Horn from the main part of the city and notable for its Genoese influence, the Galata district to me had the potential to be a standout area, but it just ended up feeling underdeveloped and somewhat neglected. We also visit Cappadocia in the game, which is a hidden city controlled by the Templars. But this part of Ezio's adventure is very short and not very memorable compared to the rest of the game. Even though the game adds some cool new ways to move around, like the hook blade that lets Ezio climb better and use zip lines, these features do not make up for how the game does not show much variety in the city of Constantinople. The new gameplay features to move around do make exploring the city more interesting, but the city itself does not keep you interested for long. One district in Constantinople makes you feel like you've already explored all the districts, and that's pretty much it.
This video is sponsored by War Thunder. War Thunder is the ultimate free-to-play combat game, available on PC and consoles. Command a massive fleet of over 2,500 tanks, planes, helicopters and ships from 10 key nations, spanning early 20th century biplanes to today's cutting-edge military technology, with armoured cars, fighter jets and battle tanks. Experience intense battles with War Thunder's highly detailed vehicles, stunning graphics and authentic sounds, putting you in control of history's mightiest machines. Join a global community of 70 million players for thrilling PvP action and explore a vast array of content that military history fans will love. War Thunder is simply unmatched in its depth with so much high quality content to sink your teeth into. There is simply no game that's better suited for fans of military history. War Thunder caters to all players with three unique modes, increasing in realism. Arcade mode is for fast action with boosted vehicle abilities and easier physics. For the real challenge, simulator mode offers full realism with no guardrails to assist you. Realistic mode balances excitement with true to life gameplay. Whatever your style, War Thunder has you covered. My personal topic in War Thunder is its detailed customization. The game offers an extensive range of options for personalizing vehicles, including a wide variety of camouflages, historical insignias and decorative items, with so many designs contributed by the community. So start playing War Thunder for free on PC, PlayStation or Xbox. Click my link in the pinned comment or the video description to register. New players or anyone returning after 6 months can grab a huge bonus pack on any platform. This includes several premium vehicles, the unique Eagle of Valor vehicle decorator, 100,000 silver lions and 7 days of premium account access. This offer is only available for a short period, so make sure you don't miss out. The very first Assassin's Creed game gives me mixed feelings in regards to the setting and the world of the game. It takes place during the Third Crusade in the Holy Land and Ubisoft Montreal did do a pretty impressive job in terms of historical value this game brings, whether it's little details, architecture, clothing and societal norms. It's this type of attention to detail that can make a game's world feel believable and quite immersive. But the more you actually explore the world of Assassin's Creed 1, you notice that the three cities of Jerusalem, Acre and Damascus share very similar layout and architectural style, which Ubisoft attempted to differentiate with distinct colour filters. You've got Acre in a greyish blue tone, Damascus bathed in brighter orange tones and Jerusalem cast in greenish yellow light. However, these efforts do not quite succeed in giving each city a unique feel to them. Another negative point is the horseback travel between the cities, which I personally found uneventful and dull. These segments were meant to connect the major locations, but they ended up being long stretches of empty and unengaging gameplay, lacking in any interesting encounters. Despite the city's architectural repetitiveness, Assassin's Creed 1 did a great job of making it feel like they were distinct atmospheres for each city. When you just walk into the streets, you do get that sense of immersion in the era through preachers on the streets, marketplaces, street performers and city guards shouting at the civilians. I cannot really recall off the top of my head another Assassin's Creed game that has such good ambience and atmosphere to the cities. However, when comparing the original Assassin's Creed to newer games like Valhalla, Mirage and hopefully Codename Red, its age definitely shows, especially in graphics and visual details. The game was groundbreaking in 2007, we can't deny that, but by today's standards, the visuals appear outdated. While this is partly due to the technological limitations of the time, it can still feel somewhat frustrating compared to the detailed worlds that we see in recent games. But I am 90% sure we're going to be getting an Assassin's Creed 1 remake, so that's quite hopeful. Anyway, despite these issues, the game's historical setting and its role in pioneering the series' world-building efforts cannot be overlooked, so it's just a decent world. It's not amazing like the ones after, but it's a solid 7 out of 10. Who knows, maybe with that remake, it could hopefully elevate the Holy Lands to new heights. Imagine seeing Masyaf Castle in today's standard of graphics. Okay now on to 8th place in this video and I've gone with the world of Assassin's Creed 3. So before I get into it, I have to say that from this point on in the video, these 8 settings are great. There are genuinely not many flaws to all of them. Now Assassin's Creed 3 stands out as one of the most distinctive within the series. Taking place in colonial America amidst a chaotic period preceding the American Revolution, we get introduced to Connor, an assassin of both English and Native American heritage. Now the world of this game is divided into several distinct areas, each offering something different to the other. We've got the frontier, Boston and New York. Now starting with the frontier, this area of the game is a personal standout for me. It showcases the wild untouched landscapes of early America that's just full of forests, rivers and mountains. I mean there's even wildlife which is something innovative at the time. We even got the introduction of dynamic weather systems and seasonal changes which I'd like to think added a lot of character to the various regions making it feel more alive. Especially considering that moving around in the snow is a lot different compared to moving around in spring. In contrast to the frontier, the cities of Boston and New York bring to life the urban experience of the 18th century. Boston's tight, lively streets and 
markets reflect the growing desire for independence among the people. Important historical landmarks in the city like the Old North Church and the Boston Massacre site are not only impressive to look at, but also play key roles in the story. Meanwhile, New York, which in the game was damaged by the fire and controlled by the British for a good part of the game, offers a different feel from Boston's atmosphere of rebellion. I will say the biggest addition to Assassin's Creed 3 was how it introduced free running through trees in the frontier which was a massive bonus for me. So overall, Assassin's Creed 3 excelled in portraying the time period's life. The homestead missions provided insightful looks into the varied lifestyles of the time period, and moments like watching animals hunt or simply observing daily life aboard the Aquila offered immersive glimpses into the time period's challenges and realities. While it may not be the strongest game in the series overall, I feel like putting the world at number 8 is a pretty fair representation. Okay now moving on to 7th place, and for this particular position, I've actually gone with the most recent Assassin's Creed game as I've been making this video, and that is Assassin's Creed Mirage. Now the game's depiction of Baghdad, alongside the landscapes of Alamut and Anbar is nothing short of stunning. This game excels in its portrayal of its setting, and experiencing it on 4K on PC definitely enhances its beauty. While I'm not sure about console experience, it's clear a tremendous amount of effort were into creating Baghdad. In fact, I believe the workers over at Ubisoft Bordeaux studied Baghdad's history quite extensively and a lot of dedication went into its development. You can explore Baghdad on foot, horseback, camel or by canoe. The NPC designs stand out, with vibrant crowds and detailed interior designs adding a lot of depth to the city's atmosphere. The colour palette and vibrancy of Baghdad are particularly noteworthy. Having a personal fondness of Assassin's Creed Origins, I was pleased to find similarities in the desert expanses and architectural styles of buildings. For me, Baghdad ranks as one of the better settings in the series. However, there is a notable emptiness outside the city. The vast desert areas, while expansive, offer little beyond a handful of structures and enemy camps, which mainly provide crafting materials. But then again, this game was created with a focus on a more linear experience, and Baghdad is the main centre of attention and it's definitely clear to see. The diversity of Baghdad is exemplified by landmarks such as the Nestorian Monastery and the Great Mosque. The monastery, nestled by the Greek's gate and surrounded by vineyards, serves as a testament to the city's multicultural fabric, while the Great Mosque, with its trio of majestic blue domes, showcases just pure architectural brilliance of the era. One of the most notable locations in Baghdad is the Bazaar, which is a hub of trade and commerce. The amount of sights and sounds in this location is spectacular, and it's pretty much quintessential Baghdadi. So overall, Baghdad is a great city for Assassin's Creed. Ubisoft Bordeaux did such a good job of creating a world that's feels alive. And despite what you may think of Mirage as a game, there is simply no denying that the city of Baghdad is one of the better cities in the franchise. Okay now we move on to the first Ezio game out of the trilogy and that's Assassin's Creed 2. You would think that the first game in a trilogy would have the worst features, but that's not the case with the world of Assassin's Creed 2. Now even though Assassin's Creed 2 is my favourite game in the entire series, I can confidently place the setting at 6th place, and that's totally fine to say. Unlike Assassin's Creed Brotherhood, this game has multiple cities, and each city actually has a different feeling to it. The Renaissance marks a pretty important moment in history for Italy and the entire world, making it the perfect setting for the franchise's big transformation. When it comes to the city of Venice, its portrayal in the game truly captivates me. The detailed canals and the slim pathways are created with remarkable precision, bringing to life the city's crowded atmosphere through dynamic crowds and vivid hues. This vivid and densely populated environment marks a notable shift from the more barren landscapes of the Holy Land in the first game, which felt more like a rejuvenating change of pace. A standout moment for me is the carnival sequence set in Venice. The depiction of the masks and celebrations brings out a vibrancy and uniqueness in the city, turning it into a pretty memorable and unforgettable sequence. It's even with Florence as well. That city, just like Venice, provides unique explorative experiences. Florence is shown with breathtaking accuracy, from the majestic Duomo to the square of Piazza della Signora. Its attention to detail with real life landmarks is what makes it a great depiction of Florence. And then there's the city of Forli, which is a massive departure from the likes of Florence and Venice in almost every way. Forli is definitely less majestic than Florence and Venice, and it offers a different aspect of Italian life. It's a more fortified marshy region that introduces us to the challenges of traversing through less hospitable terrains. Together, these cities not only serve as stunning backdrops for Ezio's story, but also play pretty important roles in the overarching narrative, each introducing new allies, new enemies, and pieces of the Templar vs. Assassin conflict. You could even include Monteregioni as another explorable city in this game. The addition of a personal mansion that we can decorate and upgrade further personalises the experience, making it a character in its own right within the story. And then add all of what I just said with perhaps one of the best soundtracks in gaming history composed by Jesper Kidd and you've got yourself such an incredible world. But to be honest, it's more nostalgic that I love a 
Assassin's Creed 2's world, because in today's day and age, the cities in this game could definitely use a remaster, or maybe even a remake, especially considering this game did come out in 2009. So moving on to my personal top 5 settings in the entire series, and I just have to say before I talk about these next 5, any of these settings can swap place with each other and I would not even bat an eye as these are all my personal favourites, but unfortunately I have to rank them. Now in 5th place I've gone with the Caribbean in Assassin's Creed Black Flag. This game takes us on an exciting adventure through the 18th century Caribbean, a setting that's stunning and a key reason why this game is so loved. Now what makes Black Flag's setting really shine is the huge world. There's simply many islands to visit, each offering different landscapes such as dense jungles, steep cliffs and urban cities being Havana, Nassau, Kingston and a few smaller locations. The Caribbean Sea expands around these islands, packed full of ship battles, secret treasures and pretty interesting spots to find. The amount of time we spend navigating the seas with our trusty vessel the Jackdaw is as thrilling as just being on foot, well except for tailing other ships. We don't talk about that. The idea of the Caribbean being a setting for Assassin's Creed is definitely a risky one, and Ubisoft's bold move to shift the game's setting turned out to be a pretty huge success. With exploration feeling endlessly engaging, instead of relying on eagle vision on your ship, you can now use a spyglass to spot enemy vessels and uncharted territories. Yet arguably the most entertaining aspect in my opinion of Black Flag's environment is its harmonious blend with the game's mechanics. The standout feature is undoubtedly the naval combat, maneuvering through the large ocean, engaging in ship to ship combat and just boarding enemy ships are flawlessly woven into the open world exploration and the game just consists of diverse online pursuits including treasure hunts and assassination missions adding a lot more variety than just ships. The pirate theme is perfectly captured in this game and it is clear to see that. I love how the game blends traditional Assassin's Creed with piracy, making it still feel like an Assassin's Creed without losing the series essence. So whenever I hear people say this game is a good pirate game and not an Assassin's Creed game, I just don't agree with that statement whatsoever. The cities, most notably Havana and Kingston, are distinct and full of so much character, with Havana's Spanish flair and vibrant music, contrasting with Kingston's more restrained English atmosphere. Black Flag's world is a world that excels in portraying a time where diverse cultures intersect in harmony and conflict. After all, the game does unfold during the golden age of piracy, an era when the Caribbean was a haven for the most infamous pirates ever known. I just love how we get to cross paths with historical icons such as Blackbeard, and Barney and Charles Vane, alongside fictional characters that are created to blend smoothly into this once legendary backdrop. I think when compared to my video from almost a year ago, Assassin's Creed Syndicate's world is untouched in terms of where it ranks and I still stand by that. Assassin's Creed Syndicate was released during a period where a lot of us felt overwhelmed by the frequency of new Assassin's Creed games in the series, leading it to be somewhat overlooked over time. However, its portrayal of Victorian London is truly exceptional and honestly deserves a lot more attention than it gets. The developers have done a remarkable job of vividly recreating this iconic city. The level of detail in London is without a doubt the most most refined and well crafted. In fact I have a hot take for Syndicate and that hot take is in terms of little details and historical accuracy it's probably number one in that regard and by far. While it may not have the technical prowess of unity with its Parisian architecture and reused assets, Syndicate offers a more stable graphical experience and brings back that day night cycle which is massive for a game like Assassin's Creed. As soon as you enter the game's version of London, the attention to detail just hits you in the face. The authenticity of the architecture, the attire and the vehicles to the era is striking. The depiction of the industrial revolution is especially compelling, with factories emitting smoke and steam engines rumbling through the urban landscape. Now what distinguishes Syndicate from other entries in this entire series is the diverse range of settings it offers for exploration, whether scaling the heights of Big Ben just to ponder out the city's panoramic views, or simply winding through the labyrinthian streets of Whitechapel. Each district's layout and designs have been created by the developers to make it seem like a fresh and engaging experience. The introduction of the rope launcher, despite being a one-off feature, facilitated the design of wider streets, without the need for numerous connecting ropes between buildings as seen in Unity. Now I will say that the rope launcher is a feature that I feel like should only belong to Syndicate as it fits the world of that game perfectly. A similar situation is the wide streets. Yes, it's not exactly perfect for parkour, but that's what the rope launcher is there for. And whilst these wide streets might seem like a disadvantage to a lot of people, there are some advantages to them. For one, they enable more realistic carriage chases and create a sense of scale to major landmarks like Buckingham Palace and St. Paul's Cathedral. Plus, there's just that excitement in racing atop a carriage, dodging through traffic to reach your goal. Now, some people may criticize the game for its lighter take on the typically dark and gritty Victorian London, which might not align with everyone's expectations 
limitations. However, Ubisoft chose to create a London that's more expansive, that's more realistic and more enjoyable. So with that said, 4th place is the perfect spot for me. Okay now moving on to the top 3, and when compared to my previous video on the settings, this top 3 was entirely different. In fact in that video my top 3 was Black Flag, Odyssey and Origins, and now it's in a completely different order. Anyway when it comes to my third favourite, it's honestly between any of these 3, but I ended up going for Assassin's Creed Odyssey's Ancient Greece. The setting is just stunning, contributing massively to the game's popularity within the series. Whether you think that contribution is good or bad, that's entirely up to you, I could not care less. Now Ancient Greece in this case game does such a good job showcasing everything from expansive urban cities to countryside villages, each brimming with historical and cultural depth, the vivid hues of Greek buildings, the labyrinthian alleyways of Athens and the rocky cliffs of Crete combine to create a world that's not only visually striking but also enjoyable to discover. Odyssey is a game that I feel like if you enjoy photo mode in video games then this is a game for you, simply because of all the breathtaking landscapes, interesting characters and historical wonders making it pretty hard to not pause and just admire the view. The world of ancient Greece is full of a mix of historical personalities and events, alongside mythical figures from Greek legend. Beyond the main story of ancient gods that Assassin's Creed explores, the game brings to life mythological creatures like Medusa, the Minotaur and the Sphinx. It's definitely a massive departure from what a lot of us are used to, but I'd be an idiot to think that this game is bad at all. I remember the first moment I played Assassin's Creed Odyssey, I was convinced at that time it was the best looking setting. My fascination with Greek mythology meant that it naturally held a special place in my heart. The world of Greece in this game combines the details seen in games like Syndicate and Origins with the large open world exploration similar to Black Flag. I've said in past videos multiple times, everyone has a comfort game, a game that they can just replay for the sake of relaxation and enjoyment, and Assassin's Creed Odyssey is surprisingly my comfort game, and it's not because of the story because well that's not exactly the best story, but it's more so the fact that the world is just incredible to explore. Maybe it's got to do with that part of my life on the day I first played the game that makes it my comfort game, I have no idea. Now the reason it's third place and not first is because certain parts will feel repetitive, I won't even sugarcoat it, but that's quite literally my only downside with the world of ancient Greece in this game. And that brings me to what I would consider used to be my favourite setting in the entire series by far, and since that video 10 months ago, I've replayed every game quite extensively, and I will admit, Ancient Egypt is incredible, but it's what's at number 1 that takes the cake for me. Anyway for second place, we now have Assassin's Creed Origins Egypt. This game alongside Assassin's Creed 2 is my personal favourite and for many reasons. When it comes to the setting of the game, the depiction of Ptolemaic Egypt is truly one of a kind, quite literally. In fact what other video game out there depicts Egypt as well as this game does? It does such an incredible job of capturing my imagination like no other. The world that you have created is a world that's simply a joy to explore, whether it's scaling the majestic pyramids to the very diverse range of wildlife, and even exploring all of the cities the game has to offer. There's so much in ancient Egypt that makes it a standout setting in the series. The extra year that you have had to work on the game clearly did show, and you'd simply just be lying if you think otherwise. Whatever your thoughts may be on the new genre of Assassin's Creed, you do have to admit the world of these games are simply stunning. Well except for Valhalla. Now I'd recommend watching my video where I went over origins in more detail, because I described the world in that game much more elaborately. The lighthouse of Alexandria's ginormous scale is as breathtaking to ascend as any tall structured tower previously seen in the series, emphasising the richness of Alexandria itself. It kind of reminded me a lot of the Galata Tower in Assassin's Creed Revelations. Just simply walking around the city of Alexandria is endlessly fascinating, and the thought of what our world once had, with the real life library of Alexandria which tragically was destroyed by a fire, evokes just sheer amazement at what once was part of our world. A key highlight is the dynamic day night cycle and unexpected sandstorms, making the immersion in this ancient world feel a lot more real. The game also creatively introduces hallucinations in the desert, adding so much more depth. You see the world of Origins is not just about surf its exploration, underwater discoveries adds another layer of adventure. With various modes of transportation like boats, horses and camels, the large landscape of Egypt becomes easily traversable, encouraging extensive exploration beyond just the main story. That's why open world games are made to explore. If you just rush to a game like Origins main story, then you might as well just get a refund because you're playing it wrong. Each city from the modest Sais to the opulent and Greek S Cyrene is carefully designed, showcasing just how diverse each city of ancient Egypt is. There's a reason why Origins is my most played Assassin's Creed game by far, and Ancient Egypt is definitely one of the main reasons. Add that on top of a very memorable protagonist and a great story and you've got yourself an incredible game. 
And last but certainly not least, we now have my number one spot as my favorite setting in the entire series so far. Remember, I said so far. We don't know what Feudal Japan will look like, as well as the Witch Trials, so who knows? Maybe my list can change. Anyway, Assassin's Creed Unity's depiction of Paris was 5th in my video 10 months ago, and the fact that it's now 1st in this video shows how much my mind can change, especially after replaying the game. So this game is set in Paris during the French Revolution, and the game's depiction of the city is simply stunning. Of course it's set during the time when the Eiffel Tower was not constructed, which is a shame, but the game still incorporates this aspect with the Helix missions, and oh boy, it did not disappoint. Now the main reason why Unity is number 1 is because I genuinely did not realise how much detail was put into the world of Paris. It's simply on par with Syndicate's attention to detail with just how accurate everything seems to be. The transition from playing it on a base PS4 to a high-end PC is massive and it enhances every little detail. Unity sets such a high standard with its detailed and visually stunning representation of Paris, rivaling other open world cities even 10 years post launch. Its one-to-one -one scale creates an expansive and immersive experience unmatched in the series, complemented by very notable larger crowd sizes. What makes the setting of Unity special for me is the dynamic transformation of Paris throughout the game. Initially, Paris presents itself as a tranquil, orderly city. However, as the revolution gains momentum, this blissful peace gives way to chaos. The escalation of conflict is mirrored in the cityscape. We see buildings crumble, streets are barricaded, and Paris morphs into an actual war zone. If you've seen the cinematic trailer for the game, then you know how well the French Revolution is portrayed in just that very short trailer. I feel like Unity was unfortunate to release in such shit state as it hindered its overall value as a game. The performance issues did detract from the setting's charm. I won't even deny that. But in 2024, the game is as smooth as butter and I'm judging it based on right now. In fact, just talking about Unity's launch now is a bit boring and that's just such an easy and cop out explanation to give. When I made my video 10 months ago, I based my opinion on Unity from playing it near launch and I criticized the crowds a lot in that video, but now I don't really see any issues. One thing I value is how Unity integrates historical personalities and occurrences into its story. The game features a roster of characters from history, including Robbie Spear and Napoleon, embedding once real events within its storyline. One of the most notable parts of Unity's world is the Notre Dame, a building with an insane amount of detail. In fact, I recommend after this video, just boot up Unity and go to the Notre Dame. You'll notice small details that you would never notice if you did not stop and stare. The behind the scenes for creating this specific building is insane. I recommend watching this video. It's only six minutes long and the behind the scenes of how it was created was astonishing. Considerations like research, copyright concerns, technical restrictions and gameplay limitations were all important just for this one building. So yeah, Assassin's Creed Unity for me has the most detailed and alive world and it's my personal favourite alongside Ancient Egypt. Once again, a big thank you to War Thunder for sponsoring this video. Remember, you can play War Thunder for free on PC, PlayStation or Xbox by clicking my link in the pinned comment or the video description. New and returning players who have not been active for 6 months will get an amazing bonus pack on all platforms, featuring several premium vehicles, among other fantastic items. This is a limited time offer, so don't miss your chance. So there you have it, that is my personal ranking of every setting from each of the 13 mainline Assassin's Creed games. Who knows, maybe in another 2 or 3 years time, if I'm still alive on this channel, I can make this video again and it could be entirely different. Maybe codename Red Setting can be a top 3, or maybe it might just flop entirely and be as bad as Valhalla's world. Oh god, I hope not. Let me know what your list is when it comes to the 13 mainline games in terms of settings. I'm quite intrigued to see what your opinions are. Anyway, if you did enjoy this video, do consider hitting that subscribe button. Button. And with that said, I'll see you in the next one.